um, start by uh, welcoming everybody. Um, thank you for coming for this weekend of uh, teachings with the Venerable Yuntun on karma and reality. So this is, um, we've chosen the topic of karma and reality um, for two reasons. Um, the Discovering Buddhism course right now is on the wisdom of emptiness. And so this is what reality, one of the meanings of re reality here. Um, and also two aspects to karma, or two aspects to reality is, is causality, which is karma, and the absence of inherent existence. So, but um, I, won't, I won't elaborate on that. But that this is the reason, part of the timing is because of the Discovering Buddhism course. Um, and we're really pleased to, to invite Venerable Yuntan here. We've had several people in our community recommend her as a teacher. And um, having watched some of her other YouTube's uh, presentations and spoken to her, um, I think this is going to be a great weekend. Venerable Yuntan has been a nun for 18 years. Um, so despite that she looks much younger than that, uh, she's got a great deal of experience. She studied um, um, in depth in Australia in um, Chenrezy Institute, as well as, as uh, many other places uh, studying retreats and so on. So um, we're in good hands today. And um, so without, like, without much further preamble, uh, let's welcome our Venerable Yuntan here and um, enjoy enjoy the, the class. Oh, one last thing I suppose I should say is, um, Lamy Schling does everything in the traditional way, which is uh, completely by generosity. So w we exist because of generosity. We, we try to be generous. Uh, and part of this is, it may seem a bit strange, but it's, it's a really important part of the Buddhist path to practice generosity. So by, by um, not asking for anything, this gives you the, the opportunity, the, the very, very important opportunity to practice generosity. So um, it's kind of a mutually beneficial way that actually the, the idea of offering to the Dharma um, produces incredibly powerful um, causes for realizations. So um, that's why we, uh, we we take this somewhat courageous approach of not charging anything and um, uh, giving you the opportunity to practice virtue. And it doesn't have to be to us. It's just the idea of, of, of um, making offerings. Okay, so enough of that. Uh, here is Venerable Yuntin. I'm here to start the video. And I'll spotlight her for everybody. There we go. Thank you. All right. So um, nice to see everyone. And uh, looks like there'll be a few people coming in, but uh, give me a little wave if you can hear me OK. Yeah. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> Great. Well, um, it's a really fun course to get to teach. And I think that there's probably quite a few older students here that have been doing this for a while. So it'll be a nice um, deepening for you guys. And then for those of us um, that are newer, then I think that uh, it's still going to be quite accessible material. So I don't think you'll be too lost. Um, today, we're going to be mostly doing karma and tomorrow we're going to be mostly doing emptiness but um they'll weave into each other because that's kind of the the premise so um in order to get ourselves settled let's uh, recite the heart sutra and really uh, reconnect that way so i'll do share screen for you i prostrate to the no three noble rare sublime ones thus did i hear at one time the Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of Vultures Mountain in Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avlokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avlokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? 
He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avlokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic. Unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, Bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having com completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata gate gate paragate parasamgate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated, even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagawan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivadiputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avlokiteshvara, and those surrounding in their entirety, along with the worlds of gods, humans, asuras, and gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. From the holy supreme realm of Kachara, you who possess powers of clairvoyance and magical emanation, look after practitioners without distraction as you would a child. To the hosts of Dakinis of the three abodes I prostrate. Aka Samara Chara Samara. Aka Aka Samara Chasara Samara Yape. Tayata gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoha. By the teachings of the noble three rare sublime ones possessing the power of truth, may all hindrances be averted, may they be eliminated, may they be pacified, may all enemies and negative forces opposed to Dharma, Shintu Kurie Soha. May the host of 80,000 obstacles be pacified, may we be freed from harmful conditions to Dharma. May all excellences be in accord with the Dharma, and may there be auspiciousness and perfect happiness here right now. 
And just sitting with the motivation, connecting with it deeply in your heart. Okay, so um, I guess it's important that if we're talking about karma and reality, that we do a quick review of the Four Noble Truths. I'm guessing that more than half of you are very clear about your Four Noble Truths and uh, they're your old friends, but I think it's important. So let's just uh, take a minute and review them. Does anyone feel comfortable telling me your... Um, one minute summary of the Four Noble Truths. Does anyone feel game? What's your best pithiest doom, 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 doom? So everyone's free to go off mute if they wish. Um... And of course, now I'm scrolling through looking at all of your faces and uh, some of you don't have your video on, which is okay. But if you'd like to put them on, it's nice to see your heads. It is. It's nice to see people's Lauren, reactions when you're teaching. Laden, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Bonjour. Hi, uh, Bonjour. Hi everybody. Um, so four noble truths are the truth of suffering truth of uh, the um, the cause of suffering the way to eliminate the cause of suffering the, the path to eliminate the cause of suffering truth of suffering uh, cause of suffering uh, the uh, no uh, how to cess ceasing the suffering and the path which uh, lead to eliminate the suffering. Yeah, nice, nice. And uh, do you guys remember when in the piece it was that the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths? Of course, he taught them many times, but his most famous time was when? The very first time at, he taught. At, at Sarnath and uh, yeah, just outside of, um, uh, what's the big place there in India? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah, Baranasi. Baranasi. Yeah. Have you been there? Like... You've been there, haven't you? The Baranasi. big uh, Mahab yes, the Mahabodhi yeah. stupa, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's so beautiful if you've ever been there because uh, all the different traditions of Buddhism go there. And it's very harmonious, happy kingdom over there. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful um, experience and vibe. And the ancestors of the original Bodhi tree are there. So it's, it's lovely. So, you know, it was the first thing he talked about, wasn't it? To his five best friends. You know, it was his five best friends that he was hanging out with and studying with and practicing with. And then remember, he did the big radical break and he decided not to starve himself anymore. He decided not to be so hardcore about his practice and actually have some rice and start to nourish himself. And that gave him the strength for his final meditations where he actually achieved nirvana and went on to achieve full enlightenment. So it, it was a big deal that he decided to teach this because not everyone has 
the mental space or the karmic predisposition or the openness of mind to hear these profound truths. And so the fact that he um, kind of honored that friendship with his five friends who at first kind of um, looked down on him for going a more moderate route, I think that was a great act of kindness and humility. He wasn't holding a grudge. He wasn't having a superiority complex. He thought, you, my brothers, I'll share this with you. And they had enough space to actually listen to him with humility, hear it and transform their minds. So the Four Noble Truths, you know, it never goes out of style, right? Even if we've been practicing Buddhism for years and years, to just kind of sit with kind of the, the elegance of it. You know, first he taught the truth of suffering. Why did he teach that first? He taught a, a result first, an effect first. And I think it was so elegant and so in tune with the human condition because he hooks us with what we already know. Yeah, we already know that we're suffering. We know that our body is not always comfortable. We know that our mind is not always comfortable. And even in our happiest moments, there's an edge of discontent or worry, or it's gonna end or comparing it to something else. And by just naming the universal human condition, immediately people kind of lean in and they don't feel so alone, you know, that, it's not rare or problematic or unique to me that I'm not happy with my life completely, even when everything is perfect. Even when I have enough food to eat, even when my body is healthy enough, even when I have enough resources, even when my friends and family are being nice to me, even when work's not too stressful, still there's a little edge of discontent. And that is not unique to me. I'm not broken. I'm not the weird one. That's universal. It's, it's really profound that he sort of started there. And it makes you go, why then? Yeah, if this is the state of affairs, why is that the case? And it pulls you immediately to the truth of origin or the truth of cause, right? And what are the causes of that suffering? And he starts to discuss karma and disturbing emotions. So karma and disturbing emotions is just coming from your mind, isn't it? So then it takes the power away from objects and external things in a very empowering way. So you say to yourself, all right, if my suffering is because of my karma and my disturbing emotions, that means I'm in charge of it. That means I have more control than I realized. That means I'm not necessarily a victim of circumstance in the way that I've always felt. I can kind of take the reins again and start to orchestrate my own experience in a way that's more healthy and positive. What a relief. This doesn't just have to keep happening, all of this suffering. There's a cause and I'm in a lot of control of that cause. And it pulls you into wondering, is this just life? Is it just life that we have negative mental habits so we hurt ourselves and others? Yeah, is suffering just inevitable and we just need to make peace with it? And you wonder. And then the Buddha sort of shows his life, he shows his experience in the moment and he shows how happy and contented he is to his fellow practitioners. And they kind of wonder, something's different about you. Are you happy? <laughs> like all the way? Are you all the way happy? Are you all the way compassionate? Is your wisdom fully developed? And he was. And he's saying, yeah, suffering can end, you guys. Suffering can end. And so again, he's talking about an effect, a result first, which makes you wonder about the cause. So the effect, cessation, makes you into what is the path to that cessation. And so true paths and true cessations or true cessations and true paths, they are really discussing reality or the wisdom realizing emptiness and how it's already a fact, but realizing that will cut the root of your suffering. So the first two noble truths are kind of talking about karma issues. <laughs> And the second two noble truths are talking about reality issues. 
And um, so I'll just do kind of a, a brief summary of that for you, just in case there's some new folks or even you folks that have been around for a while, just to kind of get it tidy in your head. And then we'll move on and have some discussion and see if you wanted to add anything. Okay, so. Okay, so first noble truth, suffering, right? <laughs> An effect of karma. And I thought this verse from Lama Chippe was really uh, apt for this case. So when we think about the truth of suffering, we think there is no difference between ourselves and others. None of us wishes even the slightest of sufferings, nor is ever content with the happiness we have. Realizing this, we seek your blessings that we may enhance the bliss and joy of others. And a blessing from a Buddhist context doesn't mean save me. A blessing from a Buddhist context means may I re be receptive to the things that open my heart and transform my mind. Yeah, may I develop. So a blessing is not something you get bestowed on. It's that all of the enlightened energy of all the Buddhas is trying to help you all the time, but you're just kind of blocked and creating an illusion of separateness. So by requesting a blessing, you're opening yourself up to be flooded with aid and inspiration. So you just start with this reflection. There is no difference between ourselves and others. And of course, part of you thinks, yes, there is. <laughs> I'm nothing like that difficult neighbor down the road. I'm nothing like that amazing person I look up to. But we all are the same in that. We just want happiness and we don't want suffering. And we're mixed up about the causes for that. And our strategies vary, but the underlying drive is the same. So then second noble truth um, disturbing emotions and karma itself, the origin. So when you see the origin of suffering, or excuse me, the second noble truth being origin, sometimes it's called cause, depends on your translator. What the second noble truth is referring to is disturbing emotions and karma itself, because those are the origins or the causes for all the trouble. And so we think, should even the environment and the beings therein be filled with the fruits of their karmic debts and on wish for sufferings pour down like rain. We seek your blessings to take these miserable conditions as a path by seeing them as causes to exhaust the results of our negative karma. So even if everything around us is chaos because of our karma ripening, and all of this suffering is coming to us just like a downpour. We are trying to be receptive and open enough to the path that we see it all as fuel for our practice. And not only fuel for our practice, but part of the mind kind of rejoicing in the fact that that old negative karma is finishing. What a relief. So that bad headache, if I bear it well, if I don't react with anger because of it, the karma for that headache is finishing with the headache. It's exhausting itself. What a relief. So these first two noble truths, they go like this, right? You have suffering, which creates disturbing emotions and negative karma, which leads to more suffering, which leads to disturbing emotions and negative karma. And it just goes around and around and around. And of course, there are opportunities to break the cycle at either end. And that's what we talk about with the third and fourth noble truth. But if you just come back to experientially in your life, there is suffering, and then there is a disturbing emotion, and then there is an action. But they come together so quickly, we behave as if it's all one thing. You know, I felt unwell, I was grumpy, and I spoke harshly. It was all one moment. When in fact, there is a sequence there that if we have enough clarity of mind, if we develop our spaciousness and mindfulness, we can catch the little points of transition and interrupt or create like circuit breakers. But right now, unexamined, this is how life goes. 
So then the third noble truth, cessation, or like finishing, right, cutting, is the end of disturbing emotions, karma through realizing reality, meaning the emptiness of inherent existence. So the verses go, having abandoned the faults of dullness, agitation, and mental wandering, we seek your blessings to complete the perfection of meditative concentration through the samadhi of single pointed placement upon the nature of reality, which is that all things are void of true existence. We seek your blessings to complete the perfection of wisdom through the space-like yoga of single-minded placement upon ultimate truth, conjoined with the ecstasy and great bliss induced by the discriminating wisdom analyzing suchness. We seek your blessings to perfect samadhi on illusion by realizing how our external phenomena lack true existence, yet still appear like a mirage, a dream, or the image of the moon on a still lake. So there is an end to disturbing emotions and karma through realizing reality, but it's not magically all in one moment. We need this kind of sequential thing where we develop single pointedness and we bring that single pointedness to our awareness of lack of inherent existence. And then we have to train ourselves in seeing everything as illusory. But the thing is, is that when we can join single pointed concentration with the wisdom realizing emptiness, it's very blissful. And it's something to look forward to. We don't wanna think of it as a chore. This is actually something very beautiful that our mind has the potential to do. And then the last one is the method. Yeah, the method to end disturbing emotions and karma by realizing reality. So this is many of our favorite quotes from Lama Chopa, which is samsara, cyclic existence, nirvana, the state beyond sorrow, lack, even an atom of true existence or inherent existence, while cause and effect, karma, and dependent arising are unfailing. We seek your blessings to discern the import of Nagajuna's thought, which is that these two are complementary and not contradictory. So this is really what we're all boiling down to with the course, but really the lifetime and many lifetimes is to understand how the trouble we're in, samsara, cyclic existence, and the peace that we seek, nirvana, and hopefully then going on to full enlightenment, both of them, the bad news and the good news, lack even a little bit of inherent existence. Neither of them exist from their own side, independent. Cause and effect and dependent arising are unfailing, which means ethics are essential always, even though they lack inherent existence. And it feels like that's contradictory, but it's complementary. And this is really boiling down to the middle way that you hear Buddhists talk about all the time. So to kind of cut through this pattern from suffering to disturbing emotions and karma, we can do some prevention with the wisdom realizing emptiness. If we miss our window, disturbing emotions and karma leading to suffering, we can purify with the wisdom realizing emptiness. Most of the time we're talking about preventing suffering from turning into disturbing emotions and karma through mind training methods, through developing patience and compassion and all of these other methods, all of which are very important and we need to be good at, but it's kind of like symptoms relief. Yeah, we're, we're kind of, you know, putting a Band-Aid on while we develop some more skills and we're not getting rid of the fundamental problem that keeps our mis misunderstandings alive. Then, you know, when we get to purification, right, you've already done the disturbing emotion and negative karma, and it's about to lead to suffering and you don't want it to. Usually purification, we talk about Vajrasattva practice using the four opponent powers.
right? But here we can really be looking at also the wisdom realizing emptiness as a powerful tool for purification. So we're going to come back to all the reality side of things a little bit later. Now let's just look at the first two noble truths specifically about karma. And before we get into karma, I just wanted to make sure we cancel any um, misunderstandings before we even start. So just a reminder, <laughs> karma is not describing any of these concepts. Okay, karma is not fate, not destiny, not predestination, not punishment, not retribution, not reward, not a judge of justice or a jury administering justice. Karma is not personified, though it is personal. Okay, so just cancel all of those in your head before we even start talking about karma. Because even if you've never had a Buddhist class about it, there's all these ideas floating around in popular culture, aren't there? Yeah. Okay, so before we dig into karma, did you want to clarify anything about just the overview of the Four Noble Truths or add anything that you found really useful when you've studied it with other teachers? Do you have a general sense of it? Is it pretty familiar? Now I'm scrolling through looking for nods. Yep, clear enough, familiar enough. You've heard this story before. Yes. Um, hi, scrolling. can you hear me? Oh, Andrew Bull. Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, just, just uh, you know, uh, thank you so much again for teaching. Um, you know, just a quick point that I, I found it interesting that you mentioned that the second uh, noble truth, uh, you know, is about uh, disturbing emotions and karma, where usually, you know, the popular uh, explanation is that it is about craving. Mm. Yeah, but, but you know, I, I really appreciate, you know, bringing in all disturbing emotions and karma as the second noble truth. Like, could you expand on that? Yeah, yeah, it's it just, a good point. And of course, some people, when they explain it, they would um, not say disturbing emotions, they would just say ignorance, <laughs> right? Um, so some schools of thought, they say, you know, truth of origin is craving or desire, or ignorance, meaning ignorance about reality. From the Galukpa presentation, we're trying to kind of um, give you a broader sense of the whole problem. So, of course, the first problem, even though there is no first moment because we believe in beginningless time, but the root of samsara is what? The ignorance, what kind of ignorance? The, the ignorance that views the I in your own mental continuum and holds it to exist inherently. That type of self-grasping is the root of samsara, that view. And because of that view, craving makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so it's like, ignorance is like the start, even though there's not a start. Craving is what keeps you there. Yeah, so craving is what like, keeps the wheel going again and again, because you're because of your ignorance, you're confused about what helps and what harms. So you have this push and pull in your mind all the time, craving for things that help this false eye and craving to be separated from things that seem to harm that false eye. So there's this push and pull, push and pull all the time, all sorts of branches of disturbing emotions. And all of these branches of disturbing emotions, some of them are committed to, <laughs> like believed in or invested in. They're not just kind of passing by habitually, but they're latched onto as truth. And then you behave from that place say from my place of craving to be away from you I will speak from anger or because of my craving to be close to you I will be placating and validating so this is what we we do isn't it is that we have a whole mass of disturbing emotions that take turns being the dominant one but you know at the bottom is you know at the bottom is ignorance and then the various types of craving and branches and branches <laughs> right yeah yeah so yeah it's interesting 
it's interesting the way the different schools summarize it, you know, wh what they choose to emphasis, um, emphasize says a lot about what they think is the most important thing. Uh, yeah, and yeah. you know, it's, it's really a question also of um, style or technique or affinity. You know, for some people, it's very useful to just go straight to ignorance and look at reality. For other people, it's much more useful to deal with the symptoms of ignorance and to look at their anger and their attachment. So if you can picture that wheel of life that you see at the doorway of lots of Tibetan Buddhist monasteries and other traditions as well, with the big scary monster holding the 12 links of dependent arising, with the six wedges of the six realms, with the white side and the black side, with the core, the core is, you know, usually got like a rooster looking thing and a snake looking thing and a pig looking thing, right? That's the battery Hello. of How cyclic existence. That's the Did battery. You ever ask your mom about these plants if she wanted one or two. <laughs> Somebody's um, not muted and we can hear your conversation. I can see that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've muted them. Oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. So, so this battery of anger, attachment, and ignorance, they're sometimes shown as like biting each other's tails. And we can get overwhelmed and think, where do I even start? But it's like, just catch one <laughs> and start there. Whether you're catching your ignorance, or you're catching your anger, or you're catching your attachment, picking one of them as your project for the day is useful because the others will lose power. Yeah, the others will lose power. So experientially, when we're talking about karma, karma really boils down to mental intention. And then we talk about karmic paths of action and various nuances in the Lam Rim. But basically think about, you have an intention, which means the mind is moving towards or away. That's kind of the, the way mental intention works. It's moving towards or away a different objects, objects of the mind, right? And as it moves towards or away those, the afflictions kind of gather and strengthen and turn into behavior. And when it's a behavior that is planned and chosen and done and rejoiced in, when it's a fully fledged, I did that on purpose, that creates the kind of karma that we're really talking about, the kind of karmic seed that gets planted on our mental continuum, which will then ripen as suffering, but also has the power to ripen as a whole new negative rebirth if we're not careful. So there's a lot of kind of incidental karmas throughout the day, right? Like. You might be walking from your footpath to your mailbox and accidentally step on an ant and not even realize it. It's a very, very minor karma. But if you see that ant, hate it, want to kill it and stamp on it and think, ha ha, I got it. It's very heavy karma. So on the surface, it looks like the same thing. You killed an ant, but intentional or not intentional has a great deal to do with how significant the karma is and what it's going to lead to, right? We know this, yeah? So karma is mental intention. Experience is where karma ripens or feeling. Some of you maybe have studied minds and mental factors or sem semchung with Geshe-la. And of the omnipresent mental factors, intention is one. You always have intention. You also always have feeling. Right? You always have an experience physically and mentally of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And that's where karma is ripening. But it's old karma. And that's why we get confused, because what we feel right now isn't about right now. But the intentions we create because of it, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, we create intentions based on past stuff ripening. So we're always playing catch up in our life. You know, we think, oh, I'm angry right now. That must mean there's a problem right now. When in fact, what it is, is that maybe a few minutes ago, maybe a few hours ago, you allowed a negative state of mind to kind of fester. And there was some habitual outside conditions around you. And that watered a seed. And now you feel unpleasant. 
Yeah. You watered your own seed <laughs> and then it took a minute and it blossomed. And now you have this unpleasant experience and you think it's about hundred percent what's in front of you. Yeah. And then you react as if it's all about what's in front of you and you perpetuate the confusion. Yeah. And we do this a million times during the day and we're always looking for something to soothe or something to prevent or something to distract all the time, try and kind of escape the discomfort or the unease of the present moment, giving all the credit to the present moment for why we feel how we feel. And, you know, it takes two seconds of analysis to see that that's not the case, whether we even understand karma or not. You can see that it's what's happening right now isn't about right now, but we don't usually take the time to consider that. So, you know, put yourself in a very ordinary circumstance, like sitting in an outdoor cafe with a good friend. Okay, you're sitting in an outdoor cafe with a good friend. Um, everyone's vaccinated, you can have your masks off. You're enjoying yourself, right? And you're really having a beautiful conversation. It's so nice to see them again. And it's starting to get a little bit chilly. You're getting a little bit cold, but because you're so happy, about connecting with your friend, the experience of suffering of cold just kind of fades to the background. And it's a very small part of your experience. And it's only if it kind of escalates, do you do something about it and say, actually, let's go in or I need a coat. But it's not aggravating you. You don't turn your attention towards it and give it power because what's in front of you is too important. But if you were in the same exact situation with the same exact temperature in a conversation you were not enjoying, suddenly the cold is a big deal, right? Suddenly the cold becomes like a prominent part of your experience and you're like fidgeting and you're like doing like this and you're warming your hands up and you're getting kind of like, oh yeah, look, I'm really with you, but we need to go inside. The same exact temperature right? But two different experiences based on what your mind is doing with the circumstances and what your mind is watering, right? What kind of seeds your mind is watering. So like you already know this, right? You knew this before Buddhism. You knew this as a kid even probably. And yet in the moment, how true it feels that it's this thing's fault. I feel this way. Like we give up all sense of having any kind of choice. Yeah. So when you've heard about conversations of karma before, what, where do you get stuck? Where are the points that really kind of hang you up and you just don't understand how that works or you do understand how it works, but you don't know what to do about it. Yeah. Where are your karma issues? <laughs> My karmic issue, I think generally is I know what I'm about to do is not going to lead to happiness, but I do it anyway. And why do you do it anyway? I think it must be the habit is so strong. And, and it will give you happiness temporarily, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> very temporarily. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, is we want to be nice to ourselves about this, where it's not like our samsaric habits don't work at all. They do kind of work, right? Like if you're depressed and you eat a cookie, you have a moment where the cookie really does help. Right? <laughs> but the problem is, is that because once a cookie kind of helped you feel better, now you always go to that, hoping it will do the exact same thing. And some days it works and some days it doesn't. And some days your mind is so agitated that before you've even finished one little cookie, you're anticipating the whole sleeve of cookies. You haven't even enjoyed one before you're thinking, nom, 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 you know, cause you're too rattled. But it's not to say that once upon a time when you were sad, a cookie was a condition for happiness to arise or relief to arise. But we just keep giving all the credit to the cookie, you know, rather than the mind that we brought to the cookie. You know, it's, it's a funny thing. So I think some of our resistance with karma is that certain things habitually 
have, you know, a high percentage of kind of soothing us. So we don't want to let go of them completely because we don't know what to do instead. Yeah, what do you do instead of your old habits of self-soothing? So you know they're not ideal, but you know, they're probably socially acceptable enough, polite enough. They don't aggravate your housemates too much or your neighbors too much. You know, so maybe it's something like, you know, your your parents modeled having a glass of wine after dinner as a way of relaxing from work. So now you have a glass of wine after dinner to relax from work, but something about your karmic predisposition and your brain chemistry and your past trauma and many, many things means that you don't have just one, you have five, but you're a functional alcoholic and you're fine for work the next day and you don't drink all through work, but you know it's not ideal to have five glasses of wine every night. You know that already, you know, someone's saying you're an alcoholic. You're like, yeah, I know, <laughs> but you're not going to give it up because it does kind of help a little, but it's become problematic. But what do you do instead? Can you kind of touch whatever your habit is of self-soothing and imagine taking that away from yourself? The space that opens up is a frightening space. It's a frightening space. What do I do instead? And why do you need to do anything instead? Why can't we just be? But just kind of like allow yourself to feel the panic of not being stimulated or soothed. You know, imagine any of the teenagers in your life mid scroll and you take their phone from them. The rage and the panic and the just the tears and the whatever, just the fear of not being stimulated. So we want to be gentle with ourselves when we're talking about karma and really near to our exact experience in this moment and picture, okay, so I'm going to go to do that negative habit that I know is not ideal, but I have no plan what to do instead. And it's going to be really rough. All right. How about my plan is to just sit quietly and look out the window and be bored. My plan is to be bored. Let's plan on boredom. And your brain will freak out for about three minutes. And then it'll relax. And then you'll become creative. Because the mind always is looking for an object in a way to entertain itself. It's just that that three minutes or five minutes is really uncomfortable. The transition time between going with the flow of your old flow conditioned by karma and disturbing emotions, interrupting it and trying something different. So if you can remind yourself that that transition point is where the discomfort is, it doesn't last forever. You could do anything for five minutes, right? You could poke yourself with needles for five minutes. It would be horrible, but you could do it. You could last, right? Why can't we just sit quietly and be bored for five minutes? because we have this grasping at permanence that thinks I will feel this way forever and I can't bear it. But if you can kind of remember those times where <sighs> release, relax, creativity comes back to you, spaciousness comes back to you, lots of things come back to you. Of course, also what can come back to you is a series of things you haven't been dealing with. And that's part of why we live in this disassociated, distracted way. You know, you know what happens when you meditate, right? We all know what happens when you meditate. You're like, oh, great, I'm gonna meditate. Hmm. Okay, okay. And then you settle, settle, and then remember all the things you've been putting off or have meant to do or wish you were doing instead. And you know, if your life is not too traumatic, you're maybe just remembering your greatest hits of memories, you know, you're going through your greatest hits, you may be adding a soundtrack, or you're imagining a past that never happened. So you're taking out all the uncomfortable parts of your favorite memories, and filling them in with extra sunshine, and you know, doing that. Or all of your, you know, epic, I don't know, intergenerational trauma is roaring to the surface and you're like, oh gosh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Or you just kind of vague out, right? And you think, oh, I'm meditating on emptiness, right? But you're just like vaguedout, out, space cadet, just like hmm, 
static, right? Right, the classics. So, okay, that's normal, that's human, that's the first, first noble truth. How do you move through that with like friendliness and patience that's not then giving in to your old pattern of, this is uncomfortable, I have to do something. Because that's what keeps that cycle going again and again. That feeling of, this is uncomfortable, I have to do something. It's like, whew. how about we just don't add any fuel to the fire of our negative states of mind. And just kind of digest everything that has happened before. Imagine it that way. I'm sitting quietly, I'm watching my breath, but in the background, what's happening is like a mental digestion and integration and settling and sorting. And every time I get kind of drawn to, I don't know, the pleasant memory, the unpleasant memory, or the distracted tendency, you just go, oh yeah, that's a normal thing. And back to the breath. So you're not pushing away those tendency, you're acknowledging them and coming back to the breath. You know, it's a little bit like if you're looking after a baby and the baby's crying, you don't just let the baby cry, right? We know better now, maybe in the fifties, people let babies cry, but now we know, pick up the baby, right? And you're like, hey, what do you need? Food, cuddle, hug? I don't know how to hold babies, obviously like this, right? So you go, what do you need baby? And the baby, you know, maybe is not very clear about what it needs but you still pick it up and check, right? And that's what we need to do with our mind is sometimes we don't even know what's wrong it's just a big jumble of overstimulation, but come back to yourself and say, it would be very normal to get swept up in these emotions. I'm not bad for getting swept up in these emotions, but for this very brief time, back to the breath. Yeah. So back to the breath, back to the breath, back to the breath. Eventually you can move on to a mental image instead of the breath it's kind of your appearance of breath right here at your nose or a mental image like the buddha appearing in your mind's eye but the idea is to gradually stop believing karmic appearances and stop rolling along with karmic tendencies and gently simplify and steady the mind with single pointedness and this single pointed attention that we're trying to develop, shine or shamatha, this single pointed mindfulness meditation is the thing that's gonna help us in our daily life stay focused with whatever we want to do. But the side benefit is that a focused mind is a lot more ethical. So it's much easier to prevent negative actions of body, speech and mind, to prevent negative karma if your concentration's good. It's kind of self-reinforcing. Like the more ethics you have, the less distracted your mind is. The less distracted your mind is, the easier it is to be ethical. Can you kind of like feel that experientially? Like in those meditations that are really hard, sometimes what's really hard about them is trying to excuse and justify negative behavior. Yeah, or trying to think of, think of things to come back to people who have been mean to you. Problem solving from an afflicted place, you know, can really keep the mind very agitated. But if you're kind of held with, say, your refuge vows or your bodhisattva vows and just connect it with refuge and bodhicitta, and then one simple focus, you really can absorb into it a lot more easily. So you know, with single pointed concentration and having positive karma in our life are very related, but they're also very important for then when we bring the wisdom realizing emptiness to it. Because otherwise, our habit of analysis will overpower our ability to have concentration and will become all kind of stirred up again. So right now we've got our two projects, right? We have developing single pointed concentration and developing analysis. And right now they're separate. Eventually they'll come together. And through that, we cut the root of samsara or we achieve the third and fourth noble truths. So that's kind of your nutshell. Um, I thought we'd have a short break and then do a meditation. Does that work for you guys?
yeah, short break and then meditation. And um, if you're having kind of um, interesting questions that you're a little shy to share, you can put them in the chat. Okay, so um, let's see, five minutes enough? Yeah. Or do you need 10? Five? Okay. Yeah. All right, five Great. minutes. See you, see you soon. I have to see Venerable Yunjin answered my question very, very well. Really impressed. So if you've uh, if you've arrived here through um, a pace Facebook posting, um, just to let you know that this teaching continues this afternoon and also again tomorrow. Uh, we start again uh, this afternoon. I should really have checked. I believe it's at one thirty. Uh, yeah, one thirty, I believe. Yeah, and then again tomorrow tomorrow morning at eleven, and again at one thirty.
Okay, so get yourself into meditation posture. Nice straight back. And really feel grounded in your space and make sure that you're on mute so any of your breathing or bump noises don't come through. And so start by relaxing the body, starting from the crown of the head, scanning through down to the tip of the toes allowing any tension you find to release and relax. And then just for a few moments to allow surface distractions to settle, bring your focus to the breath. Just the breath. If your breath is shallow, you simply know that it's shallow. If it's deep, you simply know that it's deep. Just be with that deep knowing of the breath process, choosing not to fall into distractions, coming back when you do.
a focus that is neither too tight nor too loose, just attentively riding on the breath. And whenever your focus drifts, just gently but decisively come back to the breath. And as the mind settles, revive your bodhicitta motivation in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. I'm doing this meditation. You can frame it in your own words, but allow altruism to touch your heart, to set your intention. and shift to analysis and start by thinking about the first fact of karma as described by Lama Tsongkhapa in the Lama and Chenmo. Karma is certain or definite in that happiness is from positive beneficial actions, suffering is from negative destructive actions. The substantial cause, the seed, the main part of my experience. Just really think about how that certainty of karma lands, the way on the surface it makes good sense seems very practical, but what insights or doubts do you have about it? Happiness is from positive actions. Suffering is from negative actions. How does your mind respond 
to that premise. Karma, the law of cause and effect. For us, we don't completely understand all of the millions of subtle nuances, all of the countless conditions. But does that simple idea of positive actions leading to happiness, negative actions leading to suffering, does it sit well? And so anything that you have a doubt about, try to really clearly articulate it to yourself. Try to really nail down what the issue is that you're having and repeat it to yourself so you don't lose it, so that you can investigate it further. We don't force a belief we don't have. And then anything that feels like a new insight or a deeper understanding, repeat that to yourself. Allow the repetition to make it sink in. And then shift to the next point about karma, which is that karma increases or magnifies from one seed, many branches and fruits. If left unchecked, both positive and negative karma expand, their potency increases. What impact does that idea have on your mind that karma increases? Analogies of karma are often together with analogies related to the natural world. Literal seeds, literal plants. The way the seed of one thing can only produce a fruit or a plant of a similar type. And the way one tiny seed can expand to great impact.
And so does it somehow make sense to you that karma increases from one tiny positive act, a huge ripple effect of benefit, from one negative act, a ripple effect of negative impact or suffering? How does that sit? Is it a maybe, a yes and, a yes but, no way? So without filtering or editing, just examine your own response to the idea that karma increases. So from one karmic cause, many effects or results. Karma is the cause, but it's not the same as its results, though they're of a similar type. There's the potency or the potential that we created with our mind, like a seed planted in the ground. And like a seed, it could stay there forever, unwatered, no sunlight, and never blossom into experience. Conditions are important. But think about the fact that we are the one who is the gardener, which brings us to the third point about karma which is that we only experience the results of things we've created the cause for. If we are experiencing it, we created it. Even if it was eons in the past, a millennia ago, almost a different person than who we are today. But then again, we're a different person to who we were yesterday or 15 years ago. And yet still there was a legacy left. So whatever we experience, both good and bad, happiness and suffering, this mental continuum created it through the power of intention. So how does that sit? Me personally, I created this. All of this comfort and joy and support, all of these obstacles, difficulties and pain, 
inner and outer. I dependently, interdependently created the causes for, but it was me, the agent. How does that land? How do you feel about it, that idea? If I'm experiencing it, I created it. Which doesn't excuse other people's harmful behavior. Which doesn't give no credit whatsoever to the kindness we've received in our life from others. But it puts us squarely at the driver's seat There are significant conditions, but we created the cause. We created the cause. And then the last point is that actions once done don't go to waste. Meaning that the karmic seeds we've created, the thousands, millions, trillions, all of those seeds, they don't go to waste. They don't get stale or lose their potency over time. They actually increase in potency over time. So all the good that we've done is never lost. All of the destructive actions we've done never lost. Until, until conditions come and it ripens into experience, then the seed is finished or exhausted. Or, we purify in the case of negative karma. Or render impotent through the power of anger and wrong views. That's the way to destroy our positive karma. So karma can be made impotent, not able to bear fruit but only if a countermeasure is applied or it's experienced. Otherwise, it just stays there, a possibility. How does your mind respond to that idea that karma doesn't go to waste unless it's experienced or burnt?
And so summarizing, karma is certain, karma increases. We only experience what we personally have created. And actions once done don't go to waste. I don't have to believe all of this right away, but keeping an open mind about it might enrich my practice. So allow your mind to hold open any questions and to reinforce any positive, useful conclusions. And then all of the energy we put into these thoughts, we dedicate. Janchu Sancho Rimpoche, Magi Panam Keguachi, Kevan Yampa Mepai, Gone Gondu Pawasho, Tony Dawa Rimpoche, Magi Panam Keguachi. And thinking that the agent, ourselves, the object, who actions are done towards, the effect, all are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. And you can relax your attention. Okay. So see you soon. We'll have an hour break. And uh, any of the questions that are in the chat, I'll have a little look at during the break and um, kind of pull out the essence and talk about it at the top of the next class. And uh, we'll dig in a little bit more deeply. So don't lose any of the insights you had during the meditation and also none of the doubts or the questions. Just try and, you know, repeat them to yourself so you don't lose them. And uh, I'll see you in an hour. Thank you so much. Thanks.